Okay. Uh, shalom from Jerusalem to everybody. Uh, welcome to the JISS briefing on Turkey. Turkey is a large country of more than 80 million people whose location has great strategic importance for the Middle East and beyond it. This is why the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security gives great attention to the study of this country. We recently released a large study Turkish Irredentism and the Greater Middle East, written by one of our panelists today, Chai Yanorachab. We changed the format a bit today, and it is my pleasure to introduce Moa Vardi, uh, the head of the foreign news desk at Israel's public channel, Khan 11, and the host of its daily news show, The World Today, which is one of my favorites and I almost follow it religiously. Uh, Moav uh, will moderate this discussion and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much Ephraim um, for inviting me over to um, host uh, this session. Um, just the other day, we have reported here in Israel about um, a bomb that was uh, diffused um, which was found under a police car, that the police car was part of the security arrangement around some kind of rally uh, that Erdogan, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, um, was expected to, uh, to be present at in Turkey. And I think that, um, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the ideas that was uh, revolving around was um, that maybe it's a staged, it's a staged event that in some mysterious way, Erdogan wants to uh, project the image that he is threatened by external forces or within, you know, enemy of the states from within in order to rally around him. Um, a big amount of support, which is very much needed right now, need right now. So I think that, and, and of course, just uh, two weeks ago, uh, all of us here in Israel uh, were very busy in the story of uh, the Israeli couple who were arrested in Istanbul in uh, suspicious of uh, being uh, some kind of part of an espionage against Turkey. So I think that, you know, Turkey is, is also making the news in Israel. We are very sensitive. I, I think both because, uh, just a sec, just be, uh, both because um, the geopolitical significance of Turkey to Israel, and also because of the, maybe of the history that uh, the Turks were ruling this part of, of the, of the Middle East for a long time. And, and I would add that maybe because they're not Arabs, maybe there is an, an assumption, an aspiration that somehow we can find good neighbors here because they are in some way not part of the Israeli-Arab conflict. So I think that Turkey is playing a major role in the region. And I think uh, it's a very good opportunity to examine this role. And um, I'm very happy that we can explore this with two very uh, distinguished um, researchers and analysts. Dr. Hai Cohen Yanarojak uh, is a Turkey analyst of the uh, Jerusalem Institute for Tra Strategy and Security. Uh, Dr. Cohen is the editor of uh, Turkey Scope uh, Insight of Turkey F Affairs. And he was awarded the Dan David Prize scholarship in the category of past, uh, retrieving the past historians and their sources. And the second uh, panelist will be Jonathan Spire. Jonathan is a researcher also at the uh, Institute and an executive director of the Middle East Center for Reporting and Analysts and the freelance security analyst. Uh, Jonathan is uh, well known for his uh, coverage, sometimes undercover, in our uh, region, um, mainly in countries that Israelis cannot uh, visit usually. So um, 
this uh, discussion will be uh, divided into three, like the good habit in Israel. Uh, in the first uh, part, um, I would ask uh, Chai and Jonathan to give uh, some kind of overview. Chai would focus on their internal politics and internal dynamics within Turkey. And Jonathan will focus on the foreign policy or the uh, aspirations and interests uh, that Turkey trying to um, gain in the region. Afterwards, we'll, we will uh, have a short session with me asking Chai and Jonathan a few follow-up questions, and then we will open it uh, to you guys um, in the audience, in the viewers, and you can uh, post your um, questions uh, here in the uh, in the Zoom application in the Zoom uh, session here, and we will uh, select uh, several questions to address Chai or Jonathan. Um, with that, uh, with that uh, um, introduction, I would uh, like to go right. Uh, into the uh, matter uh, of the subject. Hi, um, Eitan and Ojek, I want to start with you. As I said, with a short overview of the current situation in Turkey and hi, um, the fundamentals within the Turkish culture and the collective memory, which drive what we see on the surface right now. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much in person that you accepted our invitation and you are part of our uh, today uh, joint My webinar. Honor. Thank you very much again. Uh, so um, today I would like to um, introduce uh, the uh, my paper, uh, which was uh, recently published by the uh, Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. But first of all, in order to understand the fundamentals of the Turkish foreign policy, I would like to uh, provide you a very brief um, background about um, uh, how Mr. Erdogan perceives uh, the Turkish foreign policy. From my perspective, uh, the Turkish foreign policy can be considered as his public relations instrument, meaning that uh, since his ascension to power, Mr. Erdogan is using the Turkish foreign policy as an instrument in order to get more public support. And um, uh, the, the core determinant of this foreign policy is Mr. Erdogan's partners, uh, meaning that uh, when he, uh, when he uh, arrived to power, uh, when he rose to power, his uh, first partners were the liberals, uh, then later uh, Gulenists and later Kurds. And each, every partner basically determined the essence and uh, the direction of the Turkish foreign policy. So uh, if we are going to um, basically focus on today's Turkish foreign policy, then uh, I would like to divert your attention to 2015 when President Erdogan forged an alliance with the Turkish uh, Nationalist Movement Party. And uh, when, uh, the, when these two parties, the Justice and Development Party and the Nationalist Movement Party forged this alliance, so we began to see a marriage of interests, uh, which uh, basically we can formulate it uh, in this way, uh, the marriage between neo-Ottomanism and the ideal world order in Turkish, Nizam Alam Ülküsü. Basically, uh, the marriage of these two uh, concepts uh, seeking to bring justice uh, by imposing Turkish and Islamic sovereignty uh, or influence to the region. And uh, as already Moav uh, mentioned, this uh, while uh, the Turkish economy is being deteriorated, so Erdogan, in order to divert the public attention, uh, he basically began to use the rallying around the flag um, method, as we all know in the political science. By doing that, he began to use uh, the traditional Sevr syndrome uh, of the Turkish society. For those who are not familiar with the term, I would like to provide a very brief uh, description. In the aftermath of the World War War, uh, World uh, Ver World War One, uh, the Allies and uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire signed a peace treaty, and uh, as a result of uh, this peace treaty called the Sev, we happened to see that the Ottoman Empire was smashed into the pieces, and this created a trauma 
in the Turkish society that later basically paved the way for the Turkish War of Independence. So today, whoever is familiar with the Turkish history textbooks and the, uh, the Turkish society is very much familiar with this trauma called the Ser syndrome, which means that today the Western powers are still interested in to conduct a dismemberment of the Turkish homeland. And uh, as a result, we began to see that Mr. Erdogan began to portray the Lausanne Agreement, which eradicated the Sev Treaty, as a slightly upgraded version of the Sev, meaning that he began to show the most important achievement of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of the Republic, as a nonsense defeat. And uh, as a result, we began to see the blueprints of this new political stance in Erdogan's uh, speeches. Uh, the first speech, uh, from my perspective, which was a very important one, took place in um, 20, 29th of September in 2016. There, Erdogan openly uh, accused uh, the leadership of that area uh, of that era uh, with uh, with the um, you know the, he he uh, basically accused them by being like not 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 successful. Like uh, he said that. Uh, the Greek islands, which are located at the proximity uh, to the Turkish coasts, were given for nothing to the uh, to Greece. Uh, moreover, he also uh, made another important speech in uh, 31st of December in 2017, where he emphasized how the Ottoman Empire's territories shrinked into today's uh, Turkey's uh, territories. Uh, I would like to remind you all that today's uh, borders are uh, ratified and approved by the international law. And until the arrival of Erdogan, until the adoption of this uh, neo ottomanist and ideal world order merged uh, worldview, we did not see that the Turkish governments did anything wrong against the uh, Lausanne Agreement. On contrary, in the city of Edirne, if you're going to visit, you will see a monument uh, uh, for the, uh, for the Lausanne Treaty, which is basically proving the importance that the previous Turkish governments attributed to this agreement. And um, when we are looking at the greater Middle East, so today we are all witnessing that Turkey uh, is uh, actively uh, taking uh, an active role in the Eastern Mediterranean in Libya. And uh, basically, Mr. Erdogan also used this a uh, sever card once again uh, when it is coming to the uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean. And he uh, openly said that Turkey will not bow to another naval sever treaty. And he uh, basically uh, officially adopted the uh, Blue Homeland Doctrine in Turkish. It's called the Mavi Vatan. Uh, in this regard, Turkey uh, is openly declaring that it is not recognizing a United, Na United Nations Convention Law of the Seas, which came into effect in 1982. And uh, they are trying to uh, persuade the Cypriots and the Greeks by adopting a brinkmanship policy uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. And this brinkmanship policy basically paved the way for the Turkish intervention in the Libyan civil war. And in November, 2019, we happened to see that the Turkish government signed a maritime delimitation agreement with the uh, government of uh, uh, national accord of Libya. So uh, since we do not have more time and I would like to also give uh, some space to my colleague, I will stop here and I would be very like to uh, answer all of your quest potential questions. And thank you very much once again uh, for this distinguished platform. Thank you so much, Haye. <clears throat> Obviously, we have a lot of uh, things to discuss um, later on. Um, and now uh, we are turning to you, Jonathan Spire. And uh, Jonathan, I am, we would be happy to have your analysis and overview uh, first of all, about the um, interest that Turkey is trying to pursue in the region and the way that, or the mechanism and the way uh, in which they are operating in order to achieve that. Thanks very much, uh, Moav. 
Uh, yeah, so with regard to the aims, I think, first of all, it's, it's uh, clear that since really AKP came to power in 2002, Erdogan has been seeking to, I think, quite profoundly reset Turkey's regional and international stance. And in many ways, Erdogan has departed from the models of recent Turkish history, as Hay, I think, was also pointing out, and is seeking to fundamentally recase Turkey as a standalone regional power. And that involves, I think, a sharp break from cooperation with traditional allies, obviously the United States, and also other uh, traditional allies. And as part of that, Erdogan is pursuing a strategy intended I think, to revive Turkish reach and influence deep into the Arabic-speaking uh, Middle East. And as a result of that strategy, in terms of, of practicalities, Turkey now has troops deployed uh, in three Arab states, in Syria, in Iraq, and in Qatar, and it's engaged in influence building in Libya, in the Palestinian territories of particular interest to us, I think, uh, Lebanon also, and indeed beyond the Arab world, in Azerbaijan, in Somalia, and most recently also in uh, Afghanistan. Now, in terms of the means being adopted, I think it's very interesting to note this strategy is not being pursued only by conventional military and conventional diplomatic means, but rather in the manner made familiar, I think, by the Iranians and the IRGC in recent years, Turkey is seeking also to employ the methods of proxy and asymmetrical warfare, utilizing local client forces uh, mobilized by quasi-state agencies in order to build that uh, Turkish influence. And we've seen, I think Hay also mentioned, that in recent years uh, in, uh, in both Libya and in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, yeah, Turkey's using the Iranian precedent of not only using proxy fighters, but also deploying proxy fighters recruited in one country, Syria in this case, in another area in which Turkey wishes to project influence, using Syrian fighters in Libya, using Syrian fighters also in, uh, in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, so if we turn to look then in a little bit more detail, if I can, and I don't want to use up too much time, but just to, to note the specific components of the Turkish regional strategy, a little bit looking at conventional and paramilitary and soft power methods, we know that um, the conventional Turkish military also does play a role in Turkish power uh, projection in the region. In three operations into Syria since 2016, Euphrates Shield, Olive Branch, and most recently Peace Spring, the ironically named Operation Peace Spring in 2019, we've seen conventional Turkish forces entering into Syria, fighting, of course, the Kurdish uh, YPG and also Syrian regime forces. In Iraq, Turkey maintains a base at a place called Bashika, 20 miles northeast of the city of Mosul, where Turkish officers are training at a regular force. We saw also in 2020 Operation Claw Tiger, in which the Turkish uh, uh, armed forces, conventional forces, entered into Iraq to fight the PKK 30 kilometers into Iraq. But I think if I can just spend a bit of time here also looking at the non-conventional paramilitary aspect, this I think is of particular uh, interest. And we're talking here about a company uh, called Sadat, whose name comes up time and time again when we look for Turkish fingerprints in this area. This is an international defense consulting company founded in 2012 by a guy called Brigadier General Adnan Tan Riverdi, who had been expelled from the Turkish armed forces because of his uh, Islamist outlook, and who has known President Erdogan since 1994, back in the days when Erdogan was uh, mayor of uh, Istanbul, and Tanrivoli was commanding a uh, military base in that area. Tanrivoli served as uh, Erdogan's military advisor between 2016 and 2019. And this Sadat company is the, uh, the uh, body which we see time and time again involved in uh, recruitment and training and deployment of uh, Syrian uh, fighters on behalf of the Turkish uh, interest in Libya, in Nagorno-Karabakh, and of course also in uh, Syria itself. It's interesting to note on Sadat's website, the organization calls for the pan-Islamic unity of Muslim states, and it also calls, interestingly, for an Islamic alliance against Israel. Uh, and Tanriverdi even has uh, a planned military operation, which he calls the feasible military operation, whereby Israel, in his view, could be defeated in 11 days by a uh, pan-Islamic army, which is in favor of the, uh, the construction of. Now, Sadat also has uh, made itself manifest here in Israel, or specifically in the, in the West Bank, where it is uh, accused of uh, transferring funds 
to Hamas. And <clears throat> in uh, 2018, a Turkish citizen, a man called Cemil uh, Tekeli, associated with that organization, was expelled, was resident in Ramallah and was uh, expelled, arrested, accused of money laundering by the Israeli authorities, the authorities. and then, and then uh, uh, expelled. Uh, so we're talking about uh, an international defense consulting company, but of a very, very unusual type, uh, namely one which is ideologically uh, motivated and which is engaged in pursuing what it openly uh, uh, reveals to be a kind of pan-Islamic uh, strategy. And I think that we should be watching very closely when we, uh, when we look at Turkey's uh, activities in this area to note and look into more deeply the activities of Sadat. Very briefly then, having looked at conventional operations and asymmetrical operations, let me conclude by just a quick look also at what I would call soft power or influence operations being conducted by Turkey. And here the key body to be noted is an organization called TIKA, which is the Turkish Cooperation and uh, Coordin Coordination Agency. And Turkey, uh, TIKA is active also very close to home here in Jerusalem and in the West Bank and in the Gaza Strip, and it's active also in North Lebanon, building influence there. And in both areas, what it's doing is it's investing in civil society initiatives of a broad number of, uh, of a kind and engaging in what we call dawa activity, that's to say uh, the attempt to spread Muslim Brotherhood ideology. And what's this all about? Well, if you wish to be nice about it, it's about helping Muslims globally. And if you wish to be a little bit more cynical about it, it's about preparing uh, a public in countries of interest in order that that public might be mobilized at a later date uh, to, uh, to advance uh, the Turkish interest. And obviously, with regard to Jerusalem, that's a matter of uh, very great concern uh, to the Israeli authorities. Yeah. Just to conclude, a couple of, uh, of remarks, uh, over, overview remarks to say the following. There is today an arc of Turkish activity that begins in Afghanistan, goes via northern Iraq, westwards to northern Syria, to Lebanon, to Israel, to the Mediterranean, and down to Libya. And this is an attempt to build Turkish influence uh, across a broad uh, swathe of territory. We know that Turkey is in trouble now economically, and it is seeking to repair many of the diplomatic relations that were damaged as a result of this strategy over recent years. But I'll conclude simply by saying, in my view at least, and we can discuss this later, this strategy is hardwired into the outlook and into the worldview of President Erdogan and maybe the AKP party as well. And in my view at least, it's likely to be abandoned only if uh, President Erd and only when uh, President Erdogan leaves office and not before that. So I'll conclude on that note and very happy to take part in the discussion. Thank you, man. Yes, thank you so much, Jonathan. And uh, the closure of your, uh, of your uh, overview is exactly what uh, I want to ask uh, Chaya Navojak about. Um, we know the economic situation in Turkey is dire. And I want to ask you, Chai, um, is there a chance, a real chance, that uh, Erdogan is going to lose his, uh, his seat, his power, in the coming elections. Um, we often talk about it that, uh, you know, maybe this time and, and time and again, he make it, uh, is, is somehow make it to, uh, to win another elections. And I want to ask you if there are any prospect that this time something fundamentally changed and we should expect, or at least not to be surprised, uh, if Erdogan is going to be uh, to be uh, stepped down out of power in the coming elections, okay. and why? First of all, thank you for your question. Uh, in Turkey, there is an unwritten um, traditional law: whoever is winning in Istanbul, Ankara, in Izmir, at the same time, will win the general elections. So when you we win the, looking... you win the race to to the mayor or the or the presidential I, I elections mean... in this. I mean, I mean, what I'm meaning is the municipal elections for the mayor. Whoever is winning in Istanbul, yeah. Ankara, and Izmir, or basically in Ankara and Istanbul, will win the whole Turkey. Okay, this is the basically main understanding. So when we are looking at the latest municipal elections, we happen to see that Mr. Erdogan lost the elections in these three cities. If according if, if everything will go accordingly uh, to this um, unwritten clause, he should uh, basically lose the elections. But uh, I, do not I do not think that, uh, first of all, we are heading uh, 
um, towards an early elections. In Turkey, there are some circles that uh, argue that Turkey is, uh, you know, has to go to an early elections because of the deterioration of the Turkish lira. I do not see that Mr. Erdogan will choose this option because he knows that the public support at his, its lowest. I mean, uh, this will be, uh, from my understanding, a suicide, a political suicide. So we are all going to focus for June 2023. And in this case, uh, well, I am not that optimistic again. Uh, from my understanding, Mr. Erdogan will going to uh, declare an, um, how should I say, a state of emergency. And according to the Turkish constitution, in order to declare a state of emergency, Basically, uh, the conditions are not that, uh, you know, very much uh, and not, re I mean, in real. Uh, there should be a pandemic or there should be a very uh, grave economic situation. There should be a war and uh, or there should be an, um, you know, extraterritorial military operation. Uh, so Mr. Erdogan would choose one of these options and he may declare um, state of emergency. When you're declaring state of emergency, so you will basically have the right to postpone elections. And um, if he is going to postpone the elections, uh, he is not going to be accused for not acting in an illegitimate way because he is acting according to the book. So he will still be very legitimate, but at the same time will postpone the elections. And uh, I mean, this is not a positive science. Um, I'm trying to analyze what will happen in the future. I may be proved wrong. Uh, the I, am, I'm, I just want to ask you, yeah. um, for how long you can postpone the elections by the, by the constitution? I mean, for if two I'm, years, for if, three if years? I'm, or if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, he should postpone it every three or four months, but he, he has to receive the approval of the parliament. Anyways, uh, so in my opinion, uh, if we're gonna go to the elections and if he would be defeated, as we happen to see in the municipal elections, he may reject, uh, he, he, he may uh, basically reject the results. And uh, later he may ask another uh, round. And, uh, you know, in the municipal elections, it was easy for him to, to surrender and accept the results of the second uh, elections. But in, the, in this kind of a circumstances, he will lose the power and he knows it very well. When he is going to lose the power, his opponents will come after him. And this is a matter of survival for him. And uh, as a result, uh, Jonathan already spoke about uh, Turkey's proxies. Let us not forget Mr. Erdogan also formed uh, some armed uh, groups inside uh, Turkey, uh, the very known reinforcement forces, Takviye, and the Bekçi forces, the neighborhood guards, are uh, pretty good examples for this kind of a, a thing. Also, let us not forget the police uh, special forces, the police özel harekat in the Turkish language. So all of these uh, armed forces are loyal to him. And I would like to give you a very concrete example about the arbitrary notion of the Turkish uh, state right, right now. Approximately two months ago, uh, a foundation which was affiliated, uh, which is affiliated with the Turkish government had to evacuate um, an office uh, in an island called Büyükada. And uh, despite the fact that the court had the decree that uh, that particular office had to be evacuated, the Turkish police forces came there and barred the entrance of the uh, Istanbul municipality people so that they could not uh, basically uh, implement the court order. So what we are seeing in Turkey, I mean, if a very tiny office that is affiliated with the government is not basically evacuated and with an arbitrary action, the Turkish police uh, is barring the entrance of the Turkish Istanbul municipality officials. So let me ask you then uh, a question. Uh, okay, Moav, you tell me, you tell me uh, the person who is not eager to evacuate a tiny office in Büyükada, will he be eager to evacuate his office in the presidential palace in Ankara? Well, I hope 
he will, but I'm very skeptical again. No, but but I, I want no, but I'll ask this uh, question, Chai. Um, if you want to reject the the uh, outcome of a uh, of uh, democratic elections, um, you probably have two options. One is the uh, is the one that uh, Putin is practicing, which is okay. Putin is not a good example, but to forge the elections. To forge the the, uh, the results, right? Okay. And then apparently you want them. The mm -hmm. other one is to uh, is to is to make uh, Turkey no longer a democracy and a totalitarian regime that is uh, totally backed by uh, suppression and force. Is that is that the scenario in case Erdogan going to lose? I well, mean, the, um, the the democratic... precisely, pre precisely, you know, there's a saying, uh, tell me who your friends are and I will tell you who you are. Uh, today, Turkey is making a rapprochement with Russia and with China and doing everything in order not to deteriorate its relations with uh, these two states. And uh, this is very much, I mean, um, I, I do feel concerned about uh, Turkish democracy because uh, this will basically put Turkey in a very different category. Uh, we are also seeing this not in terms of democracy and uh, freedom uh, of speech or freedom of democracy, but we also see it uh, in terms of uh, Turkey's uh, choices in term uh, in the in the in the strategic in the strategic manner, meaning that the equipment of the S-400 anti-missile systems is not an ordinary decision. It's, it should not be taken as an ordinary um, uh, weapons purchase, uh, like uh, you know, purchasing um, a rifle, purchasing a submarine. No, this is something, a declaration, that you are basically locating, your, locating yourself with, and you're affiliating yourself with the other camp. And this is creating a huge headache for NATO. Uh, let, let me remind you, um, the NATO has no mechanism to get rid of its own members. When yeah. they founded uh, NATO, they did not think that a phenomenon like Turkey can uh, you know, pop up. So this is a very uh, also uh, hard situation, a very complex situation, not only for uh, the Turkish uh, opposition, but also for uh, for the West, because now the most important challenge of the West is not to lose Turkey to the hands of Russia and China. So in order to do that, you should not burn the bridges. Instead, you should maybe bite your tongue. You should basically make some concessions in order to wait for the day after Erdogan, because at the end, uh, also Israel and also the West should uh, basically treat Turkey not like Erdogan, but Turkey is a very important asset for the national security of the state of Israel. And at the same time, also for the West, this is also applicable. So we should think out of the box, but uh, the, uh, the trend, uh, I mean, I'm very concerned of it. Uh, just a short uh, follow up question. Please try to um, to ask uh, to to answer very shortly. First okay. of all, if, if, if that your analysis or, or, or presumption that in the in the in the ballot Erdogan is about to lose in the next election, or it's still and it's still very much open and and he can very I mean not surprisingly if, win. If everything will be very transparent, I think that uh, according to According to my understanding, he had, I mean, he, he would lose the elections. Okay, definitely. second question. Got it. Second, second question. In case he is going to lose and he is going to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, hold, to hold power uh, in, in means of uh, military suppression, mm -hmm. which, is a, which is a coup, which is, which is to, um, which, which is, a, you know, to, uh, an anti-democratic coup. Um, what is your sense as regard to the extent of the will of the public to 
to resist, to go out the street. Okay. To, so, to, to, to view another Tahrir Square in Taksim Square. Well, to say no more. Even, even, and, even bearing in mind, bearing in mind the, the huge price that these people who had the courage to stand out paid in 2015. Okay. Uh, again, I'm very pessimistic about it. First of all, I really don't wish that, again, I'm emphasizing, I do not wish that uh, the people of Turkey would have to go out to the streets in order to demand their rights. But uh, we already happened to see what happened in the Gezi Park protests. And since then, also the protesters and also the state, uh, they learned a lot uh, from that example. In my opinion, uh, since I already mentioned uh, that Erdogan already uh, formed the Bekchi forces, the neighborhood watches, and the police special forces, I really do not think that uh, they will leave a room uh, for the public to demonstrate and to occupy the most important public spheres. Uh, on contrary, I do believe that uh, in such a scenario, uh, we will not be able to see uh, a real public opposition uh, the uh, the most the essence of the constituency uh, the anti erdogan constituency is uh, they are consist of people who can lose a lot meaning that they are very much educated they are rich uh, or they are middle class citizens who are very much engaged with the west so these people um, from my perspective will not be able to confront Erdogan supporters who are coming from mostly from the rural areas and basically who are more uh, illiterate compared to anti-Erdogan support, uh, anti -Erdogan supporters. So these people are more weaker in terms of economy. So they will, I mean, they have something they have they have to less, lose almost. They have less to lose. Yes. So uh, in this kind of a circumstances, uh, again, I really don't wish to see such a confrontation in the streets. I do not believe in violence. You don't wish, but but the, the but the only but the only other alternative is is Turkey turning into an autocracy and a, a tyranny. Well, um, I agree with you. So uh, yeah, the, unless you the see name any, of the game. So any, the, unless you see any foreign intervention, so, so which, we share, name, which is not yes, in the card, I guess. So so the name of the game here. How will Erdogan portray this new regime to the West? If he will able to portray this, uh, as I already told you in a legitimate way in the framework of the Turkish constitution. So he will still be seen as a legitimate uh, leader. How? Because, How? I'm not talking because about of postponing. The, because talking... of the, you know, you're postponing the elections and, you know, there's a famous saying of Stalin. Yeah, 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 yeah. but there's a famous... you cannot postpone forever. I'm yes. talking about... It's so postponed forever. So, it's, so okay, one year, one okay, year, one, three, and, and three later, more rounds of postponed. I agree. And then I agree. And then I'm talking about have... the elections in the end of this round of postponing. Yes. So then, let's say we have an elections, and in these yeah. elections, if his popularity, if there will not be an economic miracle in Turkey, so I do not think that his popularity will rise again. And uh, as a result, you know, there is the famous saying of Joseph Stalin. Uh, it doesn't matter who, who, who is putting the, uh, the, the, the votes in the ballot box. Uh, it is important who is counting them. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm very much skeptical regarding the transparency of such an election, because maybe during this postponing period, he may, I'm again emphasizing the word may, he may pave the way for you know the whitewashing of the results. He may he will never lose. lose. Yes, he so, will never lose. Uh, I, I I mean, if he will lose, he will lose everything. So in my from my perspective, let us prepare for the next uh, five to ten years. A Turkey with Erdogan, I do not think that uh, he will be defeated. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jonathan uh, Spire, I'm telling uh, to you. First of all, um, do you think any positive effects that uh, Turkey's Erdogan has on the region? I mean, they are um, countering power to Iran. 
-hmm. You know, if you if you view the if you view the Middle East as consists of uh, four types of people: Jews, Arabs, Persian, and Turks. So mm -hmm. they are, you know, they are not Arabs, they are not Persian, and they can be a counter power to to the destructive parts within the Persian and the Arab people. I mean, Erdogan is countering Assad, maybe the single one most hated man for Erdogan is, is Bashar al-Assad. He is countering Iran in some way. Um, is there any positive aspect that you can see that Israel, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking now from an Israeli perspective, can take advantage of the fact that as Chaya Navojev just said, Erdogan is going to stay with us for at least a couple of years. I think, Mar, from, from an Israeli point of view, it would be difficult to find a uh, advantage, but if we think about ah, the... I was trying to be optimistic, and then you came and you ruined everything. If, if we no, think no, from, kidding. If we I'm think kidding, from, the I'm Arab, kidding. from the interest of the Sunni Arab populations and, and their, their interests, then I think it is fair to say that Erdogan is a key force today in preventing the complete defeat and eclipse of Sunni Arab forces in the Levant and in Iraq. And certainly in Syria, there is yeah, so in Syria, it is a fact that the, Syri the Sunni Arab rebellion that broke out in 2011 it would have been completely defeated by now were it not for the intervention of Turkey. Turkey today defends in northwest Syria and underwrites and guarantees the last remaining enclave of the Sunni Arab rebellion in, of course, Idlib and Aleppo provinces. Yeah, so this but at the same time, Jonathan, I'm sorry to interrupt, but at the same time, yeah. Erdogan is maybe, I mean, he's a very major player in preventing the Kurds from establishing any kind of uh, self-governed area. Turkey which, which could help Israel, could help fight Daesh, could help fight Assad. Turkey, uh, Turkey's ma the main reason for the Turkish interventions in both Syria and in Iraq is, yeah. is to fight the growing influence of yeah. uh, the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party. Um, undoubtedly so. The Turks have not been able to achieve what they would like to achieve, which is the complete destruction of Kurdish autonomy uh, in Syria. Um, they have nevertheless been able to destroy one of the three Kurdish cantons, the Afrin canton, and today that's included in the northwestern enclave which they're holding on behalf of, of the rebels. Look, I spent a great deal of time in Syria and particularly in the Kurdish enclaves, and I, I couldn't agree more that I think that area is a de facto ally or, or advantage for Israel, uh, even if there are no direct relations. The fact that the Kurds hold 30% of Syria and eastern Syria is a de facto buffer zone against Iranian advances westwards. Partial, not complete, but it's a de facto buffer zone. So even if there's no direct relations, that's absolutely uh, in Israel's interest. Of course, if that were to fall, it is likely that a large part of it would fall not to Turkey, but to Assad and therefore to Iran. So undoubtedly, that that, that enclave is an unambiguous uh, asset for Israel. I do think, though, that Turkey's prevention of the complete defeat of the, uh, of the rebellion and therefore continuing to make Assad and Iran a little bit weaker, at least in northern Syria, you know, is a good thing. I would not wish to see Iran and Assad roll into northwest Syria also, particularly because there are three million people living there. And those people would almost undoubtedly become refugees heading for Turkey in that situation. And there's been like, quite enough human suffering in Syria over the last decade. And it's good if, that could, if, if further suffering can be prevented. And in that sense, Turkey is, I would say, playing a role, you know, which is in some degree positive in that area. Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, we have uh, about 15 to 16 minutes left. And I want to, uh, um, to spare some time, or this time, uh, for the questions from the audience. Um, so um, let me start with that. Um, Isaac is, uh, is uh, asking, why aren't the activities of TIKA, T-I-K-A, in Israel and Jerusalem in particular prevented or at least closely monitored or minimized? What does Israel do about it? Mm -hmm. Hi, Jonathan, do you want to address? I, yeah. I can answer that maybe with regard to TIKA. I mean, I've okay, looked at please just, Jonathan and Chai, please, please keep um, one to two minutes long uh, answer so we will have the time to, um, to go over for uh, another few questions. 
Yeah. First of all, Israel is watching carefully and we've concerned the activities of Tika and there have already been moves to prevent some of the activity. There was famously uh, an illegally placed plaque and flag placed, a Turkish flag placed uh, at the place called the, the Yusufia Cemetery close to the old city, which was removed uh, last year as an example of, you know, when Turkey stepped clearly out of line, illegally, then the action is taken. Most of what Tika is doing is, of course, formally legal. What they're doing is they're bringing pilgrims, they're bringing tourists, they're carrying out relief work. So it's not a question of there being a legal basis for just shutting them down. Monitoring is going on. There is increasing mm. concern. And as the use of fear example showed, when Tika does step out of line, there's a legal basis for action, then action is taken. Hi, do you want to add? No. Okay. Um, so Olive, Oliver is uh, asking um, about what uh, you have just said, uh, Hi, um, about the prospect of everyone winning or losing elections. Um, Oliver is asking, uh, you think popularity uh, would shrink due to the economy, but what if, the, uh, if Erdogan managed to create a conflict to make all these diehard radical fanatics go ultra-nationalist patriotic and then still support him? And as for the economy, how do you know that uh, he will not get support from EU states? I did know this uh, before on Twitter, Twitter block, before Twitter blocked me that uh, EU folks are much, much more pro Turkey than they pretended to. Well, uh, let me answer from the, from the last part of the question. Uh, in order to uh, improve the relations with the EU, first of all, Turkey needs to take concrete steps. Uh, let me remind you, only approximately three weeks ago, we happened to see another crisis between the, United, uh, between the European Union, largely with the West, and, uh, and Turkey. Uh, Mr. Erdogan almost declared 10 ambassadors of Western countries as persona non grata because of their uh, criticism regarding uh, the imprisonment of uh, Osman Kavala, who is a very well-known Turkish philanthropist. Uh, by the way, he's accusing him uh, for, the, for orchestrating the Gezi Park protests. So uh, the, uh, the European capitals would like to see the release of Osman Kavala. From their perspective, Mr. Kavala is taken uh, to the Turkish prison with uh, no reason because he basically organized, if he did, right, uh, he basically organized a democratic uh, demonstration. Besides that, in, again, in Turkish prison, we have journalists. Again, in Turkish prison, we have uh, the, uh, once upon a time, the main opposition leader, uh, Selahattin Demirtas of the uh, Kurdish political party, the head of the Kurdish political party, together with Figan Yüksekta, uh, uh, his counterpart. So, in order to make a real, uh, a real progress with the relations with the West, Turkey, first of all, needs to take very tangible actions. And unless they are going to take these actions, I do not think that the Europeans will going to pour new money into the Turkish market. Instead, as we already witnessed this week, um, Turkey began to launch a rapprochement with the United Arab Emirates. And uh, this will create a new competition with Qatar. Nobody is talking about that, right? So we may expect a relative change in the Turkish foreign policy. But again, if we, we, if we would like to see a rapprochement with the West, so the ball is in the Turkish court, not in the European court. Okay, so this is the first thing. And uh, the first part of the question, uh, please, I, I would like to, I mean, if you can remind me the first part of the question, because I forgot it and I'm not, can you, can you please remind me the first part of the question? Yeah, the first part, the, the first part was, um, I mean, I mean, why do you take out of consideration the option that Erdogan will forge some kind of uh, external conflict Okay, yeah, will, yeah, will, thank you. All the thank you. Rise thank, up you. And, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Strongly. As I thank you very much for reminding me. As I already uh, as I already presented in my uh, in my presentation at the beginning of this webinar, I told you that Mr. Erdogan adopted a new strategy of uh, you know portraying the new Sevr, uh, like portraying the people that Turkey is under constant attack of external forces. 
and he's trying to basically rally his people around the flag. So uh, basically, we may see another brinkmanship uh, incident in the agency in Nagorno-Karabakh, and with especially with other non-Muslim states, meaning that, uh, from my understanding, the most important candidates are the nation states of the former Ottoman minorities, meaning Greece, Cyprus, Armenia, and Israel. These four states are crucial for Erdogan's popularity because every uh, Turkish citizen, uh, they do have a sensitivity, an extra sensitivity about these four states. And um, we may not see a full-scale war, we may see diplomatic frictions, we may see dogfights in the agency or in the Eastern Mediterranean. But since the European Union already began to threaten Turkey with concrete and tangible sanctions regarding uh, Turkish Navy's uh, activities in the Eastern Mediterranean, we are seeing that for now, the Turks do not want to escalate the situation. And uh, as a result, uh, I do see that uh, in the near future, Unless uh, Mr. Erdogan's popularity will hit a new low, I do not foresee uh, a new escalation vis-a-vis -vis the West. But again, I'm very skeptical regarding uh, the, the dates uh, that are, you know, like May or April in 2022. We may see an escalation in a, in a, in a, in a, in, maybe in the agency, maybe in the Eastern Mediterranean, maybe in Nagorno-Karabakh, we do not know, but Erdogan may try to seize the opportunity in order to rally his people around the flag again. So now I'm not expecting uh, a critical incident, but again, I'm emphasizing, I'm very much skeptical. Since the uh, date of the election was declared as June 2022, I do feel that uh, April and May 2022 might be very problematic and, uh, you know, spicy for the Turkish foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, I want to, um, to ask you, Jonathan, mm -hmm. um, a question <clears throat> posed by um, uh, Bondi Hakim. He asked, um, under what conditions, if any, could the Turkey-Israel relations be improved? And I just want to add that uh, recently, Erdogan is making signs that he really wants normalization. <coughs> he, he called, he phoned up uh, President Buji uh, Helzo a few days mm -hmm. after he assumed office and talked with him for 40 minutes. And I know that uh, in the eyes of Ankara, it was a huge gesture by Erdogan. Up until now, Israel is turning quite a um, cold shoulder to Erdogan. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do you see any, any circumstances or conditions in which yeah. these uh, relations can be improved? And I would add um, why Israel is reluctant and what Israel can gain if such relations be normalized. Yeah, uh, thanks, Marv. Well, uh, first of all, I think it's important to remember that relations have not and never completely broke down. That's to say, when it comes to trade relations, mutually beneficial to both countries, these have That's continued right. and indeed have, have increased. I mean, the collapse of, of the Arab of, of Syria and Iraq made the transition route for Turkish goods via Haifa port down through Jordan and into the Gulf of much greater importance. And in that sense, in oddly, uh, relations have actually improved over the last decade rather than, than declined. When it comes to the strategic and what was once the military uh, relationship, I see very little chance of that being revived for as long as Erdogan is in power. And I go back to what I said in my earlier talk, you know, this is a strategic sea change for Turkey under Erdogan with regard to its strategic and military stance. And there is simply no place, I would say, for, a, for improved relations with Israel when you have you know, a country which is supporting a, a core aspect of its regional policy is support for Sunni Islamist insurgency in a number of different contexts, by the way, including uh, within Israel and the territories itself. That's to say, you know, there's good evidence. Well, that you know, Jonathan, is. this is what I call real politics, right? So because Putin is supporting Bashar al-Assad. 
So what? He can, he can, he can, you can gain some things from Putin. You, uh, you want uh, to be Putin close to you. I mean, well, you know, you can, you can not pick your friends. Yeah, I think that's right. And I would say we'll go back then to the trade. The trade relations remain and will remain. But I think when it comes to Erdogan's regional stance, you know, Erdogan wishes to promote himself as the leader of the Sunni Arab world, if he can. You can't really have that with, you know, burgeoning uh, civil relations with Israel. So I think the reason for the Israeli suspicion is because Israel suspects. Israel knows that Erdogan is isolated right now. He's not liked by the Biden administration. He's looking very hard to find a way to get back into the good books, so to speak, of the Biden administration. And rapprochement with Israel, with the Emirates and with Egypt can form part of that. The Israeli suspicion, of course, is that that can happen. And then a year later, when it suits Erdogan once more to play the Sunni Islamist card, then he'll be you know, he'll go back to the former stance of you know, very, very deep condemnation of Israel. And therefore, is it worth Israel's interest to sort of fall for the trick? It's a little bit like with uh, Charlie Brown, with the, with the football, if you're familiar with that uh, analogy, where that girl Lucy endlessly makes a different promise and Charlie Brown always falls for it. Israel doesn't want to be in the position of Charlie Brown regarding Erdogan and therefore is reluctant, I think, to uh, respond to the charm offensive currently underway. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see if we can find another question. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, um, Okay. Um, hi to you. Um, ben Ha'el is asking, and, and with that we're going to conclude, um, would it be possible in the future um, that Iran, that Turkey would go under some kind of Iranian process, meaning okay. radicalization, radical Islamization, etc. Uh, I would add that first of all, Iran is Shia and Turkey is Sunni, but maybe to uh, make it more clear, um, to uh, to an, an, an to an Islamic country. Okay. I mean, the, the point is the point in okay the point in Turkey of Atatürk that he made uh, he made Turkey an Islamist secular state. Okay, the religion is secular. The religion is uh, is Muslim. The state the, the country is is secular. I mean, it's not. I mean, the rule the 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 civil rule is not the rule of the Quran. Yes. Un unlike Iran, right? So the, uh, just, to, and uh, maybe the, the question is, is that, is, is that maybe might, might change? M maybe we will see an, an Islamic uh, Sunni state in Turkey. If I'm not mistaken, it was six years ago, uh, you know, um, Professor Bernard Lewis, Professor Bernard Lewis, who is very well known for all of us, he was our master teacher. He visited Tel Aviv University and I happened to sit next to him in a lunch at the Moshe Dayan Center. And uh, there we chatted in the Turkish language, by the way, he was genius. Anyway, so he told me, son, one day Turkey will be Iran and Iran will be Turkey. And you should, you know, uh, make research uh, on Turkey accordingly. And as a very young scholar then, uh, I told him that, you know, I do not think like him. And uh, since you already mentioned, your, uh, Moab, uh, Turkey is not like uh, Iran because of Shiites, because of the clergy uh, and everything. But, um, but I cannot ignore that in Iran, there is a rising secularism while in Turkey, there is a rising religionization. Okay, so uh, while I'm taking this two important data on my table, uh, I, I'm not in the same place where I was six years ago when I had that lunch together with Bernard Lewis. Today, I, I still do not believe, and in the parentheses, I do not want to believe that Turkey can replace Iran and Iran replace Turkey. But uh, if you're gonna ask me if there is a probability, unfortunately, yes, there is a probability and I cannot tell you that it will not happen anymore. But unlike the Iranian case, uh, we will, I don't think that we will see the Turkish clergy as a key player here because let me divert your attention to the uh, Ottoman history. In Ottoman history, we had a very important key religious official called the Sheikh Islam. 
when whenever the sultan was weak, the Sheikh Ul Islam was basically ruling the country. And when the sultan was strong, and in most of the cases, the sultan were uh, the sultans were strong. So they were dictating the Sheikh Ul Islam to find the necessary Quranic verses in order to justify their decisions. So Erdogan uh, basically does not want to hand over uh, the rule of the country um, to the clergy. Instead, he wants to use the clergy or he wants to use the Turkish religious officials to, um, to justify his own decisions. If we're gonna make it into a metaphor, Erdogan would like to eat his steak and tricot with a sauce of religion, but he still wants to have it but for himself, okay? Because he thinks that he can market this steak better to the Turkish public with this sauce. So time will tell if the Turkish people will eat this steak and tricot with this sauce. Of course, in order to eat steak and tricot, you need a very strong currency. So we'll see uh, if the Turkish lira will be uh, back on track so that the Turkish people uh, will, uh, you know, will be uh, able to eat steak. Uh, I would like to remind you once, I do remember that one shekel was equal to 50 grush, okay, which is like cents. Today, one shekels uh, is uh, equal to more than four uh, four liras. So this is something unprecedented. And uh, this is basically telling us everything. So time will tell. Thank you very much for the question. Okay, we have to conclude. Um, <laughs> Turkey is a big enough country to um, support a three, four hours discussion, but uh, every good thing has an end. And uh, this discussion is not exceptional. Um, first of all, I want to thank you so much. Um, hi, Ethan Cohen, Yana Rojak, Jonathan Spire, both doctors, and the fine in bar, and uh, the JISS for hosting this discussion. I have, an, uh, I have a suggestion. Uh, I will put my email here in the chat. If anyone wants to ask me anything, you're more than welcome. And if Jonathan and Hai wants to put their e email here and uh, people can um, write them emails to ask questions that we, will, that we didn't have time to, to, um, to conclu conclude in this discussion, um, that, might be, uh, that might be good. I hope that it was uh, interesting. I was interested about it. And I want to thank, much, to thank so much above all to you guys uh, somewhere in the blog sphere um that um uh, that uh, took the time to listen to us thank you so much Hag Sameach, and um, maybe someday we and the turks will be friends again thank you thank you to everybody shalom from jerusalem thank you my colleagues and especially to moab Vardi. all the best to you thank you thank you